So this is the recording for lab now on Thursday, the 24th of February. Here we go. We're going to look at these two questions. So to begin with, arrange the following molecules in order of increasing polarity of their bonds, and then decide whether each of these compounds listed in the problem is polar and show the direction of polarity. This is a question that has some topics that will apply to the assignments I'm going to give tonight. Okay. Um, and I'll come back to those when we're not talking about these questions. So to begin with, uh, there are some very clear topics that apply to uh, this question. We're talking about polarity, which is definitely a uh, chapter four topic. We're talking about bonds. And uh, yeah, place them in, incre in order of increasing polarity. So uh, instead of, of course, using these molecules like I tend to do, I'm going to jump to some other molecules. But I'm going to use these to draw from. Okay. We're going to start with molecule A. We're going to make, uh, let's see, we're going to use the molecule NH3. Molecule B, was that even one of them? Let's see, NH3. No, it's not. Good. Okay. Uh, NH3. Then we're going to use the molecule uh, CH4. That probably is one of them, but that's okay. It's a, it's a common one that we use here. Another molecule uh, we'll use is CH3F. And then we will look at D, which is going to be, let's use, yes, let's use uh, the molecule I want to use here is. Yes, H2O is going to be one of them. H2O is on the list. And we're going to add to it E, which is going to be, yeah, HI. OK, so before we even get to those, so those are going to be the molecules we're going to consider. There's a number of things we need to do here. First. We need to acknowledge that we need to know the structure. That will require a Lewis structure. And that will also require, beyond the Lewis structure, that will require a 2D or 3D structure. We have to consider the geometry. We have to look at the geometry. And then we have to look at the polarity of the bonds. And then four, finally, the polarity of the molecules. OK? There's a bunch of stuff we got to do here. So. With that in mind, let's start with asking, is anyone uncomfortable with Lewis structures? How are you guys doing with Lewis structures? Are they starting to make sense? OK. It, and, it, and it makes sense that Thursday is potentially going to have a different experience of this than my Tuesday lab, because Tuesday night, people may have just gotten their first you know, couple of, of, of segments of chapter four potentially and now you guys are more deeper more deeply invested into chapter four and with that experience of course comes greater knowledge and greater responsibility i'm not gonna go there yes spider-man go away so uh lewis structures you guys are okay with how are we doing on 2d and 3d structures how about geometry Bad on geometry? OK, so how about polarity of bonds? No idea. OK, so some ideas, but uh, not, not like got a mastery of it yet. OK, so here's what we're going to do. 
we're gonna this question is a very good question to actually ask it's pretty much spot on with what i would want to do for tonight anyway so thank you uh i get to kill two birds with one stone which you can only do with a ricochet now let's start by doing the lewis structures okay let's talk lewis structures briefly um in general, the approach to doing a Lewis structure, you start by one, figuring out how many of each atom you've got, two, then you calculate total number of valence electrons, then you, this is how you do it when you're starting out, by the way. As you get more experience, you tend to be more comfortable with just drawing the structure more rapidly, and this becomes intuitive. But we're going to do it more formally, because that's just like how you learn to ride a bike. If you are learning to ride a bike, you put training wheels on that thing, you start it out. So these are the training wheels. Calculate the total number of valence electrons, uh, figure out what your central atom is, And there could be more than one central atom. So we'll say a central atom is R. And those are, we'll just define that quickly. I've defined this earlier today in, in the lecture I was recording. Central atoms can be defined as any atom uh, uh, that is covalently linked directly to two or more atoms. So as you saw in the question I was showing with the condensed structure, there definitely can easily be a chain of central atoms because a central atom is just something that is in between two or more atoms, okay? And then uh, what you do is step four, Pretty much, you figure out the rest of the structure. You figure out uh, the arrangement of atoms. Yeah, that's supposed to be one word, arrangement, not arrangement. It's the arrangement of atoms. And uh, then you kind of do number five, which is uh, basically uh, complete octets as necessary. Yes, there are exceptions. So those would be things that don't need octets or as possible. And then number six is, is uh, not required in this class, but uh, extra that you can do is use formal charge and formal charge is not a topic typically taught in intro but i do it because it's useful you use formal charge to test the structure for flaws and stability Formal charge is a topic that I tend to add to this class and don't emphasize terribly because it's not required, but it is a useful tool. So I throw it in there because it is useful. Okay. Uh, so let's just define formal charge real quickly. Formal charge is a theoretical charge on an atom uh, that you calculate by treating covalent bonds as if they were completely ionic.
Now, is anyone struggling with the difference between ionic bonds and covalent bonds? Is anyone having any difficulty with ionic bonds versus covalent bonds? Because they are very distinctly different entities. They are very different. Okay. Remember that covalent bonds means sharing of electrons, and a truly ionic bond means full transfer of electrons. Absolutely. Ah, uh, electrons not being whole numbers. I think I do. Yeah. Um, and it's not relevant to this, this question. Uh, well, I mean, let me put it this way. The, the calculation is solved with the idea of electrons not being whole numbers is very theoretical because you can't have partial electrons, of course, right? Yeah, exactly. That's understandable. That's the problem with me utilizing videos that are not someone's videos. You're absolutely right. Is it'll also contain content relevant to a course that might be general chemistry or even a higher level of chemistry that's no longer a, an intro. Uh, and of course, I can't just post parts of the video. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, issue, 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 blah, blah, blah. But um, what I will do is now say, you don't even have to remember this definition. I'm gonna just show you how to use it in a practical fashion, okay? I just give the definition because if you have any interest in it, the definition explains why what I'm about to show you does work. Okay. This is the explanation of where they, the, these things come from. So let's see here. Uh, nope. What I want to do, there we go. For some reason, that's still on. That's better. A lot better. Perfect. Okay. So. Uh, that's formal charge. Now, the other thing for this to work is, the other side is, how comfortable are you guys with the concept of electronegativity? Anyone struggling with electronegativity? It is a chart, yes. Uh, beyond that, it is a concept, of course. It is a... Um, it is a trend in the periodic table, uh, but it actually, looking at the definition is really important because often electric, electronegativity, people start to forget the actual definition of electronegativity because they start applying it. And it's a bad habit that chemists have is we take it and start applying it in ways that don't actually remain true to the definition. That's acceptable because these extensions of the definition do work, but they do need to be returned back to the original definition, which is, the tendency of an atom uh, in a bond to pull the bonding electrons to itself is really what the definition of electronegativity is about. It's about a bonded atom pulling the electrons in that bond towards itself. So this involves bonds, this involves an atom pulling on electrons. Okay. Now, that has a few direct implications. If the uh, two bonded atoms have very similar or equal uh, electronegativity values, they share 
the electrons pretty equally. I mean, if it if the if you calculate the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms, and it literally is a zero value, the zero value means they are shared equally. They are sitting pretty much in the center between the two atoms. This is like the idea of the electrons being pulled more toward one direction of the bond versus the other. So, oh, okay, so to begin with, we're talking about electronegativity. And if the two bonded atoms, therefore, have similar or equal electronegativity values, they share, they share those electrons pretty equally. OK, and you do not need to memorize the electronegativity values. I'll repeat that again. You do not need and you should not make an effort to memorize them. OK, if they stick in your brain by accident as you do homework assignments, that's different. That's not trying to make an effort. But do not make flashcards. Do not stare at them forever. Do not pine after them. Do not do anything that requires you to waste time trying to store these in your memory. OK. And I cannot emphasize that enough. So do not memorize on purpose electronegativity values. Now, using them is very simple. You calculate the difference, and you use the delta or triangle for difference in electronegativity by subtracting the smaller value from the larger. You don't get negative electronegativity values. That's not a thing. Um, so we can and and, and electronegativity Uh, difference is calculated between two bonded atoms. You don't do this for just two atoms at random. If they do, are not directly in a bond with each other, then it is pretty much meaningless, generally. Because remember, the definition goes back to in a bond. Okay. So if you don't have a bond, you de technically are not talking about electronegativity. You're talking about some other thing. We'll get there. But you are absolutely thinking in the right direction because here's what I'm going to say next. So once upon a time, in a moment like this, Two atoms start out by having their valence electrons in their valence shell, and nothing happens because they are far apart. Okay. When two atoms are brought close enough to each other, They begin by trying to form a covalent bond. Okay, so any two atoms you bring close to each other, in the instant they are close enough, they start out with the best of intentions. They start out trying to share electrons. Okay. The problem is, you look at the electronegativity chart, and on the electronegativity chart, not all atoms are created equal. You have atoms with electronegativities close to one. You have atoms with electronegativities that are actually, honestly, less than, less than one. You've got values 
that are 0 0.8, 0 0.7. Now, I say less than one. I didn't say less than zero. I said less than one, which means smaller than one. Still larger than zero. Okay. There are no electronegativity values that are negative. There are electronegativity values that are smaller than one. You also have the largest electronegativity value, which is fluorine. Fluorine is the most electronegative atom, the uh, most electronegative element in existence that we know of. Okay. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. That means fluorine will pull electrons to itself far more strongly than any other element around it. Okay. The larger the electronegativity value, the stronger the pull of that element in the bond to itself. Okay. The higher the electronegativity value, the more that atom has the ability to pull the electrons in the bond to it. Okay. Good so far? All right. So think about this as being initially two atoms come together and they try to share. But if there is a great a great enough difference in the electronegativity value, they start to not share equally. And if that value is large enough, they don't share at all. Okay? So you start out as a covalent bond. The electrons start out between the two atoms. If the difference in the electronegativity value is large enough, one of those atoms wins the tug of war and pulls the electron pair or however many electrons that were trying to be shared to itself. That is why ionic bonds are a part of this picture, because this is a fully inclusive picture that now tells you this is what's actually part of what's driving the formation of ions versus why covalent bonds form. Okay, The tug of war between two atoms, if it is strong enough, will end up with ions rather than a covalent bond. If it's a more balanced tug of war, you end up with a uh, covalent bond. That makes sense? It does, right? And seeing that picture now probably makes sense why there is something that is in between a pure covalent bond where the, the electrons are shared equally and something that is not an ionic bond, but is where there is a polarization to that bond. There is a difference in the, uh, the, elect the electron cloud around one atom versus another. And I'll draw that for you too. It's not easy to just hear the words. Seeing the pictures, thinking about this in more than one way is very important. But before we get to pictures, what I want to show you guys is one of the trends, because we haven't actually taken time in a class with uh, where I've been sitting with you guys to talk about trends in the periodic table. Okay. So for electronegativity, you can actually follow this across and see the trend. And the trend is, uh, again, like a lot of things, pay no attention to the transition elements here. The transition elements are transitory and annoying, and they do all sorts of weird stuff and cool stuff, but annoying when it comes to trying to say, hey, here's a trend. OK, because if you look at this, it goes 1.3, 1.5, 1.6. OK, yeah, it's going up, but oh, it goes back down, then it goes back up, then it goes back down. That's not a trend. That's just a like movement okay? as opposed to 1.0, 1.5, 2.53, 3.54. That is an upward trend Okay, moving through what we call the main blocks, ignoring the, the D block, the transition elements. If you just look at just the primary blocks of this side and that side, going through what, remember, we call the periods. The periods are the rows. And yes, just like saying ATM machine is a redundant thing, saying horizontal row is also a redundant thing. So is saying vertical column. Columns are always vertical unless you knock them down. Then they become rows. So going through the rows, 
you can see the trend and it resets. See, it goes one up to four. Then it goes 0.9, which is close enough to one, up to three, 0.8, up to 2.8, 0.8, up to 2.5, 0.7, up to 2.2. You can see that going through the periods. There is also a trend in the groups. Remember, the groups are the columns. Okay. Starting at the bottom, 2.2 up to 4, 2.0 up to 3.5, 1.9 up to 3, 1.9 up to 2.5. It's not perfect, but that's because these are actually trans transition elements here. 0.9 up to 1.5, 0 0.7 up to 2.1. Okay. When you're not talking about transition elements, the behavior of the trends is actually quite good. And you can actually graph this. That's the next image I have here. This graph here shows you going through a period starting at, sorry, this is going, yeah, this is going through a um, period going from lithium, going that way, lithium across to fluorine, sodium across to chlorine, potassium, blah, 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 across to uh, krypton, and then you've got rubidium, I think iodine's actually right in there. And you can see this pattern just, it, it, it really is strongest right in this area. But the point I'm trying to make is, if we go back to the previous slide, the trend is, come on, yeah, there we go. The trend is moving this direction. So electronegativity increases that direction across the periodic table, and it increases from bottom to top across the periodic table. Okay. These things are, are, in essence, related in some ways to electron affinity as well as ionization energy. Those are trends that I wish I had time to cover tonight. I, hopefully, I won't be able to record one very soon. I'm hoping tomorrow. Uh, because electro these trends are, uh, they tend to have either the same direction or opposite of each other. The trends tend to follow either left to right and top to bottom increasing or opposite directions and they tend to make sense for example one of the ones that makes the most sense going with this one is the size of the atom the size of the atom going from left to right and top to bottom you actually decrease the size of the atom atoms increase in size opposite to electronegativity. And this makes sense because, and this is now an extension going away from the idea of a bond and just talking about, oh, electronegativity of an atom. The tendency of an atom or an element specifically of that, an atom of that element to pull electrons to itself means the whole particle is gonna pull all of its electrons closer to the nucleus as well. So if you pull all your atoms at the same time, because there's nothing that says, I'm only working on things in a bond. That's the definition. But the electronegativity affects the atom as a whole as well. Technically, what you're talking about is electron affinity is more accurate for this situation. Yes. The problem with electron affinity is the measurement of electron affinity is a little bit weirder than electronegativity, which is why people tend to like electronegativity. But it is the same concept. So electron affinity tends to resemble electronegativity. The pattern for electron affinity in general is increasing, increasing. Affinity means how tight does it pull electrons to itself or how much of a desire does an, an atom have to, to hold on to electrons. So if a atom has a desire to pull electrons more closely to it or hold more tightly onto them, that means it's going to also shrink the whole particle. The whole particle is going to actually condense in on itself. There are other reasons for this too. Now, that one, shrinking, is associated with going horizontally. It becomes smaller going this direction purely because of pulling them closer and closer to each other. Okay. There's a whole lot of details about this that if I go into, we'll never go home tonight. But I'm trying to say this in as quickly a way as possible. Going, going horizontally works because you do not increase the number of uh, electrons. You, you increase the number of electrons around the nucleus, but you don't do it as fast as you increase the strength of the nucleus. 
going this direction, the strength of the nucleus increases faster than the number, the effect of the number of electrons around that nucleus. Going up this direction is affected no longer as much by the strength of the nucleus, but more by, because going up and down, what you're changing is the primary shell number. And the shell number affects the distance from the nucleus very, very quickly. The shells are huge compared to secondary, to, compared to the subshells, compared to the orbitals. The shells themselves are gigantic in comparison. So going up one period, you go down in one entire shell. Going down in one entire shell causes that atom to absolutely guaranteed to be smaller than the one below it. Or if you go the opposite direction, it means that that atom below it is going to be much larger than the one before it, guaranteed. Does that make sense? Okay, so these things also can be explained very quickly when you apply the subjects that you've already learned. Okay, that's why primary shells, quantum mechanics, all of these things are intermingled, intertwined, and inseparable. Okay, cool. Now, back to this topic at hand that we're talking about with this lecture. Okay, we're talking about electronegativity, we're talking about the effects of that on bonds is what we're really concerned about. When we look at periodic trends, look at that again in more detail, hopefully later in a different time period. But here, I want to come back to the subjects that we're really talking about. Okay, We're talking about drawing a Lewis structure. We're talking about the geometry. We're talking about polarity, ultimately. Now, why am I talking about electronegativity when I mention polarity? That's because the polarity of a bond is something very specific, okay? The polarity of a bond means the degree to which two atoms in a bond do not share the bonding electrons, electron pair equally. And I define it specifically that way because the more difference in the sharing, the less sharing there is, the more polar it is. For something to be polar means there is a great difference, a large difference, a large value of discrepancy between the two. Okay. So if you are non polar, this means uh, tending toward equal sharing. If you're completely not polar, then you share equally. Full equal sharing means you are completely nonpolar. You can still be nonpolar with a slight difference in sharing, like a slight value of somewhere between 0.01 and 0.3. Where did I put that? Uh -huh. Okay. So, looking at polarity. The actual values that I give you guys in the study guide, which should be dri should be driven uh, by the values that you find in the text. Let's see. Yes, there they are. Okay. So, yes. Perfect. 
This is now on page, I can even tell you, it's on page 35 of the study guide. Okay. Uh, so, bond polarity is measured as the difference in electronegative values of the two bonding atoms. So for example, a carbon-hydrogen bond has a difference in electronegativity of approximately, and we're just going to flip to the thing here. What you literally do is you go, okay, carbon is 2.5, hydrogen is 2.1. 2.5 minus 2.1, roughly around 0 0.4, roughly, okay? That's totally chill, cool. That is nonpolar, yes. Threshold is what you're thinking of, right? For these different values, these different places. That's exactly what I was going to get to as soon as I show you a few calculations. Yeah, I want to show you a few calculations before we then establish the threshold. Okay, so carbon hydrogen. It should make sense if you do a carbon carbon bond. Uh, and, and it might surprise you. It surprised me the first time I saw this uh, that I always get when I go 2.5 minus 2.5, I always get zero. I've had students calculate non-zero values from this, and I don't know how that happens, honestly. I really don't, but it happens. Uh, just like a student, uh, not a student, a classmate of mine in high school somehow managed to, to, to prove to himself that uh, he could do a calculation where one equals two. I think he was dividing by zero. Uh, pretty certain it came down to he divided by zero and managed to prove it. Yes, I know. Dividing by zero is not a thing. That's my point. Just like subtracting the same value from itself should always give you zero. And if you get something that's non-zero, um, enough said. So uh, a couple of other things. Um, fluorine minus hydrogen is 4.0 minus 2.1. That gives you uh, 1.9. Uh, let's go fluorine minus sodium. That's a fun one. Fluorine minus sodium is 0.9. Uh, so that gives you 4.0 minus 0 0.9 gives you 3.1. Okay, so now let's actually look at the range of values. So to begin with, this we know from experience, we call this, this is the classic example of an ionic bond. This one is definitely not yet an ionic bond, but this is uh, this is covalent, but a large difference. And then, of course, when we looked at, for example, uh, oxygen, no, not oxygen, it's not what I'm looking for. I am looking for the carbon. Hydrogen is good, but even better is, ah, uh, yes, there we go. You can't get much better than that. That really is starting to get good. Okay, so phosphorus is 2.1. So you do a phosphorus to hydrogen, that's 2.1 minus 2.1, which is zero, and that's two different elements. This is what we call pure covalency or pure covalent bond, you cannot get less of a difference in electronegativity than zero. And of course, like I said, carbon to hydrogen is uh, 2.5 minus 2.1, which is that 0 0.4. This is uh, covalent uh, with some difference. So our range, that's exactly what you asked. And so you will get it. 0 0.4 
no, sorry, zero. We start at zero. Starting at 0 0.4 is silly. Uh, starting at zero and going up to, uh, the book says 0 0.4. I tend to go 0 0.4 or 0 0.5. I like to say at least 0 0.4. Let's just follow the book, right? Zero to 0 0.4. That is going to be considered covalent nonpolar. Okay. Then the book does 0 0.5. I like to do 0. Point, uh, let's do 0 0.55. I typically like to do 0 0.6, leaving a gap in my step uh, graph, but we'll go 0 0.5 to 1.9. We define as polar covalent, still a covalent bond, but very but increasing in polarity. One point nine, very polar, and then uh, two point zero to sideways eight, also known as infinity, is ionic. Okay. Now, that may not be something that I provide you on the exam, and for and for reason being that that once you get a sense of the range, it's three ranges, and really there's only two cutoff points. Is it at 0.4 or is it at 1.9? And if you remember those, you don't even have to remember the ranges as much as the cutoff point, right? So those may not be provided to you on the exam, and even that's not a hundred percent guarantee. Don't count on them being on the exam, but at the same time, if they appear on the exam, don't be angry with me. If it appears on the exam, consider it a freebie. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, this is, of course, what we're talking about here is the ranges of uh, polarity I don't go away in bonds. Let's make this clear. This is a bond between two atoms. We're talking about the range and polarity of bonds. Okay. So is the bond polar? The bond is polar if the calculated difference in electronegativity between the two atoms is between 0 0.5 and 1.9, and it's ionic if it's above 2.0. Okay. Pretty straightforward. I hope. That's my goal. Okay. Now, are there any questions? Okay. This is bond polarity. Let's see what time is it. Does anyone need a break? Okay. I'll keep going then. If no one is going to request a break, I'm just going to keep going. Okay. I'm not trying to be cruel, but of course, the faster I go, the sooner we're out of here. Okay. So here's the next thing that we need to make clear. Here. Bond polarity does not a polar molecule make. Does not equal guaranteed polar molecule. Just because you have polar bonds in a molecule does not mean that molecule is necessarily a polar molecule. You can have highly polar bonds in a molecule and that molecule itself can be nonpolar. Okay. We'll get to that. I just want to make sure that I reemphasize that a few times. So to begin with, I think the book talks about dipoles. I think the book talks about dipoles. So, uh, it doesn't necessarily look like they look at that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so a dipole, easiest way to define a dipole. is uh, 
essentially a pair of, well, okay, a dipole could be thought of as Well, even calling it a measure is is not necessarily a uh, good use of the terminology. In general, let's see. Uh, you could you could say it is a separation or partial charge difference in a bond or molecule caused by uh, polarity. And in this case, caused, it, it really, we should say also, another thing is caused by uh, differences in electron cloud density. In a nonpolar molecule, the electron cloud is perfectly equally distributed around the molecule. In anything that is polar, the polar bond, if you have a polar bond, the electron cloud is not equally distributed around the two atoms in the bond. Uh, if you have, for example, hydrogen bonded to a fluorine atom, so of course the difference in, in the uh, electronegativity, as we saw, is 4 minus 2.1, which is, you know, 1.9, close to the highest level of of polarity you can get, well, essentially that is the highest polarity difference you can get without being ionic. You hit two, you're ionic. So that is right at the threshold of being an ionic bond. This is an incredibly electro, uh, a huge electronegativity difference resulting in the highest polarity you can have without being ionic. And what that means is if you were to look at the electron cloud, the electrons are going to spend most of their time around fluorine and less time around that hydrogen. And that results in a dipole. The dipole is the difference in electron density around one thing versus another. This is also not just talking about a bond. The convenient thing about this too is HF is also a molecule. That is a molecule, okay? So this is a polar molecule. It's not just a polar bond. It is also a polar molecule you get a partial, we use therefore lowercase delta, partial negative around the fluorine and a lowercase partial positive to indicate the dipole around the hydrogen. And then finally, of course, if, you were, if we were to fully talk about this the way that we should, you draw the dipole by putting the starting of the dipole and you demonstrate its directionality with a vector. Okay. A vector is essentially a line segment with an arrow attached to it, which just means it shows the directionality of the polarity. If you show the size of the polarity, the uh, magnitude of the polarity with the size of the line segment, you show the directionality the direction the pole, the electrons are being pulled with the arrow attached to that line segment. Okay. And all this is to do is to indicate the electrons are going away from the hydrogen. All that line segment with an arrow, that vector is showing you is that the electrons are being pulled away from the hydrogen and spending more time around the floor. Okay. Take a moment. Let's pause here. I'm recording. So I'm not going to forget to record like I did last week. Halfway through, the lecture just ends. That's not going to happen this week. I managed it on Tuesday. I'm going to manage it on Thursday. So we're talking about bond polarity. We've talked about dipoles. 
and how those apply first and foremost to begin with to a bond. The next thing we have to do now is consider how bond polarity interacts across a molecule, okay? Because uh, bonds don't exist in isolation if there are multiple bonds to a single atom, okay? Imagine, if you will, the simplest situation. Well, let's look at carbon dioxide. This is not one of the ones I chose, but this is a fairly simple structure to draw, and it also draws in a whole bunch of other stuff. So carbon dioxide, central atom is going to be carbon. Your central atom is going to be carbon. You start off by bonding each oxygen to it. You might calculate them to be a number of valence electrons. There's one carbon, four valence electrons on a carbon, plus two oxygens. Each oxygen has six. So two times six is, of course, 12, plus four is 16. Each line is a bond, so we've got two, four. Now you can just start sticking electrons onto the oxygens in pairs. So two, four, six, eight. 10, 12, 14, 16. Now I've used all 16 electrons. Okay, the uh, oxygens both have octets, the carbon does not. Well then let's just form double bonds to that carbon, one with each oxygen. And our final structure then, of, structure of course therefore becomes the carbon in the center, double bonded to each oxygen like so. And then you've got a couple of lone pairs on each oxygen. OK, see how easy those structures can be. They can be simple. Of course, yes, there are exceptions. But most of the time, you start to see the pattern. You start to see these things exist in specific ways. So now, carbon, double oxygen, Carbon oxygen bond. It doesn't matter if it's a single or double bond, the electronegativity is going to be close enough. So the difference in electronegativity is going to be as the oxygen is about 3.5, carbon is about 2.5. Yes, I do have those in my head. When you've done, when you've taught this class or even just taken these classes as often as I have, they get stuck. And I also have the Jabberwocky stuck in my head from Alice in Wonderland. That's a whole other story. The value here, 3.5 minus 2.5 is 1.0. That tells you that this is definitely a polar bond. It's above 0.4. It's not ionic. It's below 2. It's right between. I know it's not perfectly in the middle, and I also know that. The point I'm making is this is a polar bond. Okay. Dipoles, however, are equal and opposite because they are both carbon-oxygen bonds, and they are definitely in opposite directions. Now, how do I know that they're in opposite directions? Because I know and understand geometry, and I understand that because I understand VSEPR theory, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Okay, so that was a whole bunch of stuff we haven't talked about yet. That's okay. We can do that in a second. Okay. The key is, if I told you that the geometry is in this fashion, that the oxygens are opposite sides, you can imagine that the two dipoles cancel each other out. The two oxygens are pulling equally on the electron density around my carbon, and so they literally end up canceling each other out. Does that make sense? Okay. Because they cancel each other out, the molecular or molecule uh, difference in electronegativity, if you will, which is not a calculation you normally do, but it is essentially zero, meaning that this is a very nonpolar molecule. We've got two very polar bonds in a molecule, but they cancel each other out being in opposite directions, and therefore, this is a nonpolar molecule. 
So the molecule itself is non-polar, despite the fact that the bonds are very polar. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But actually, it's once you start to do this a few times, it actually gets a little bit easier because we, to begin with in this course, we don't throw super large molecules at you. And outside of that, you're just looking at the uh, polarity of a central atom. Because with in larger molecules, there absolutely are regions that are polar and other regions that are nonpolar. It doesn't really matter because the other thing is the more times you measure that polarity around a central atom, you start to see the patterns. The patterns are very repetitive. There's a finite set of structures, especially in biological systems. And so you start to see that. Now, why do we care about polar versus nonpolar? Polar stuff dissolves in polar stuff. So polar molecules dissolve in water because water is highly polar. Nonpolar stuff does not dissolve in water. And that's because water doesn't like nonpolar stuff. That has a lot to do with stuff we have nowhere near come close to right now. Okay, But that's a preview of trying to tell you why do oil and water not mix? Because oil is nonpolar and water is highly polar. That's why. We can tell you why water and oil don't mix. It's not a miracle. There's a very simple explanation to it. Okay, so let's see here. We've talked about bond polarity. We've looked at molecules. Okay. We'll come back to looking at molecules, but to be able to look at molecules, we need to look at molecule shapes. Okay. In order to be able to actually consider molecule, molecules and their polarity, we have to be able to talk about their shapes, which therefore means we've got to talk geometry. And where does geometry arise from? It comes from valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Now, the frustrating part is VSEPR is old theory. It is quite outdated. It is a very good approximation in why we still teach it. But does it actually tell you the accurate shape of this stuff? That's my answer. Just that silence there. Okay. It is not a perfect explanation of the shape, but this is also an introductory course. So we utilize approximations to get through a lot of heavy topics and show them to you in a way that is usually something you can grasp pretty quickly. Valence shell electron pulse, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, however, is honestly actually something we still use even in graduate school to just look at things very quickly. You will go into deeper theories when you're analyzing something in greater detail. Yes, absolutely. But if you're just glancing at something for a first approximation, you just go, yeah, let's use that because it is a useful tool. So it's not, not to the point where we're asking you to, yeah, anyway. So what does it stand for? Well, I've said it a couple of times out loud, but valence shell. Electron pair repulsion is what VSEPR stands for. Uh, you'll also hear, hear people call it uh, Vesper theory. Um, I used to call it Vesper theory. I can't do that anymore because when I look at VSEPR, I don't know how to pronounce that as Vesper. It doesn't look like Vesper, it looks like Vesper. So, I call it VSEPR. You can call it VSEPR. That's fine. I just, in good conscience, I can't do that to the poor acronym. I can't do that to it. So let's deconstruct those words. Okay. So to begin with, you guys know what valence shells are. And even before that, 
you know what valency means. You know what the valence electrons are, right? The valence electrons are the outermost electrons in the primary shell that is the highest, furthest away from the nucleus. They are the electrons involved in chemistry. Everything else just sits there doing nothing. The valence electrons in that valent shell are what actually are involved in real chemistry. They are the ones that do the bonding. They are the ones that do the transfers. The valence electrons are the interesting ones. Valence shell, again, those are the outermost electrons in that outermost shell. Electron pair. Why do we say electron pair? When we say electron pair, uh, we say electron pair because a bond is formed between atoms and they share a pair of electrons. Okay, so we say electron pair because bonds are formed from electron pairs and any non bonding valence electrons are almost always paired. So pair comes from the fact that bonds occur in pairs and non-bonding electrons still are in pairs. Now, beyond that, finally, repulsion. Well, electrons are all negatively charged. Now, you come to my office hours next week and you go, but well, doctor, professor, whatever you, you think of yourself as. What about positrons? That is not a topic for this class, will be my response. Electrons are negatively charged. Okay, all electrons are negatively charged, like charges uh, are repelled from one another, okay? Like does not like like when it comes to charges, okay? Electrons are negatively charged, therefore electrons repulse each other. Now, beyond that, theory. Well, I'm not going to explain that part because that's a word you can look up. It's a theory. That means it is something still being developed. It means it is something that is supported with evidence, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So, Valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. You've deconstructed it, now you get what it is. We're talking about the valence shell electrons. They occur in pairs and they are repulsed from one another. Okay. Okay. Now, just to make it more complicated, to examine geometry around a central atom, which we've already defined earlier. You do this by looking at what we're going to call electron clouds. But wait, we just said pairs. Well, there is one more thing we have to talk about. There's a problem with the way bonds form. Okay. An electron cloud. Let's the first define electron cloud. So an electron cloud is either a, a bond, and by bond I mean it can be a single bond, but a cloud can also be a double bond. A cloud can also be an entire 
triple bond. Okay. But wait, but wait, isn't a triple bond three bonds? Isn't a double bond two bonds? Isn't a single bond? Isn't a road a road, even if it has one lane, two lanes, or three lanes? It's still a single road. You don't say the three versions of um, whatever road you want to name. You know, uh, let's say Highway 80, you know, Interstate 80. You don't go Interstate 80, Lane 1, Interstate 80, 80 Lane 2, Interstate 80, Lane 3. No, you just call it I-80. Okay. okay. You don't even necessarily define it as I-80 East versus I-80 West. It's just I-80 connecting two locations. Does that make sense? So the point I'm making is, yes, you can have multiple connections within a bond. But that bond is still a single unit connecting two things. Yes, it is stronger, but it's still just the connection between two atoms. It is the road between two atoms. It is the connection between two atoms, the road between two atoms. There could be multiple lanes in that road, but there's just the road, the triple bond, the single bond. Yes. So, again, that is th this is a complex question, right? Just like if you were to say, how many uh, how many lanes are there that you could use to drive to point A from point A to point B? If it's a triple laned road, there are three lanes, right? And if you close one lane, there's still two lanes available to you, which is still more accessible than a single lane road. Right? So therefore, a, a double bond is absolutely stronger than a single bond. And a triple bond is actually definitely more strong than a double bond. But it's still just that single route, that single connection between those two atoms, between those two locations. And that's why it's, it's a complex thing. It's not just a single black and white answer. It's not a single monotone statement. You absolutely have to dissect it and see the complexity of it. Okay. A single bond is an overlap of two atomic orbitals, giving you a single molecular orbit. A double bond is the overlap of two pairs of atomic orbitals. And a triple bond is the overlap of three pairs of atomic orbitals. But they are, they are all still simply holding together two atoms. The strength is there. More electrons are involved. You've got now six pairs, six total, not six pairs. You've got three pairs of electrons or six total electrons in a triple bond, but it's still just one electron cloud. Um, a, a visual always helps, I think. So, uh, da, 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 da. atom, atom here. I'm just going to make it a blob. So this atom and this atom, if you link it with a single pair of electrons. It's absolutely not as strong as it would be, but that's still just a single pair of electrons. Uh, drawing this thing, I hope, is not going to be more confusing because the orbitals look weird. Uh, the molecular orbital, the first electron pair, would look like this. Now, a double bond, two nuclei, Again, here's the first pair of electrons in the first bond that forms. It gets really confusing because you then take two orbitals that are actually not like that between there, but you put an electron here, an electron there, and there's overlap still that occurs between these two things here, physically, like so. And that is just the second bond. And so I try not to emphasize this too much because this will start to get confusing. But the third bond forms from another set of orbitals in the third plane in three dimensions going in and out of the page. So here's X, Y, and Z. And then you get overlap here 
in that third dimension for a third dimension of a third bond there, and that's a triple bond. But they're still just between those two atoms. And it's still drawing it like this. The reason I'm willing to draw it like this is look at this carefully. It's one electron cloud. One electron cloud between these two atoms. It's just a big cloud. The cloud just gets bigger and bigger. It's just one electron cloud. That's what I'm trying to emphasize with this drawing. That's all I want you to take away from this, really, is that a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond is just one big electron cloud. Okay? That's the key here. You only get multiple electron clouds when you either have the formation of an entirely separate bond between that atom that we're talking about as a central atom and a new atom or a non-bonding pair. So you put an atom here and you form a bond with one atom here, and that's one pair of electrons, and maybe form even a double bond between these. That's still just one cloud. Now put another atom over here and form maybe a single bond there, that's just only two clouds, two separate clouds of electrons, spatially. That's what I'm really trying to communicate here is you have to look at how the electrons are separating into separate clouds, okay? And you put a non-bonding pair of electrons into an orbital, that's now a third cloud. But you only have on this drawing here, one cloud, two clouds, three clouds. And it is so hard to resist the urge to start counting in a Sesame Street voice here. Pardon? Yes. Yes, these things are very strange, but logical. You guys doing okay? Okay. Uh, all right. So I want to try to move through this not too fast, but what I'm trying to do is communicate these things in a expeditious fashion. Okay. This is dense topic matter, but I'm trying to make it accessible to you guys in a more summarized fashion. All right. So just to recount what we've talked about, I'm going to go back a few slides. We've talked about the fact that in order to be able to talk about molecular polarity, we have to be able to talk about molecule shape. That's where I'm going with this. We started with molecular polarity. Well, we've got to be able to talk about molecule shapes. Molecule shapes require us being able to talk about VSCTR, and then how do you actually start determining those shapes? You have to do it by looking at electron clouds. Okay. So counting electron clouds is how we determine the geometry. And the reason for that is electron clouds will space themselves as equally far apart from one another as possible. The electron clouds are all negatively charged. So therefore, they're going to all repulse each other. If there's more than two, then you're going to start having to space them out more than just at 180 degrees. It's easy when there's just two electron clouds. Two electron clouds means one arm in opposite directions. You know, one arm on opposite sides of that central atom and just like, uh, well, okay. Just like, uh, for example, carbon dioxide we saw. Go back to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide here, this is exactly an example of two arms, two electron clouds, one electron cloud, two electron clouds, one on opposite side, because they're now spaced out as far apart as possible, okay? It's all about trying to space these electron clouds out as far as possible from one another without causing anyone else to get uncomfortable, okay? So, 
when you have two electron clouds. For geometry's purposes, in my class, you have to have, you also remember, need a minimum of two bonds to be a central atom. Not all books agree with me on this. Not all professors agree with me on this. Some people like to go, well, there's two electron clouds. There's a, there's a, not, there's a, uh, not, there's a lone pair and there's a bond. And that's still got geometry. And I go, no, that's not a thing because it's not a central atom if it's not between two actual other atoms. It's meaningless otherwise. You're just going to confuse the students. Okay. And some people agree, some people don't. I don't care. This is my class. So, and I, I think this will be less confusing for you guys. Okay. If you have something that is between two other things, like so, you get 180 degrees separation, perfectly flat, perfectly linear. And so therefore, what do you think the name of this geometry is? It is linear. This is linear geometry. There are no lone pairs here. You have to have a minimum of two things attached. And so they must be two bonding clouds. Okay, two electron clouds. So therefore, two bonding clouds, linear geometry. Okay. Now let's talk about what it means to have bonding versus non-bonding. I'll show you guys the table. Uh, so here we go. Ready? So that's two two electron clouds. You could have three electron clouds. Now, there are two options for this. You can either have three bonding clouds where you have a central atom with three atoms attached to it, like so. So there's your central atom, and you end up with something like that. Now, this thing, uh, up to three clouds can all uh, lay in the same 2D plane. So when it is two clouds, it's actually even just one dimensional. It's linear. When you hit three, it's now two dimensional, OK, lying in the same plane. Lying in the same plane, okay? So, three bonding clouds in the same plane. Does anyone remember what the name for this is? Exactly. Trigonal for three. Trigonal giving you the shape based on three. And like I said, it's in a plane, so it's planar. See, these names make sense. Linear, trigonal planar. It makes total sense. If you think about the definitions of these things, the names are telling you what they are. They're screaming at you. I'm trigonal planar. There's nothing else this can be. And yet I will get other names on the first exam. I know that. I get that. But it's trigonal planar, and there is no other name for this thing. Trigonal planar, that's it. You can't even technically call this purely planar because there are, I mean, I guess planar is, uh, no, I don't want to go there. You can't call it trigonal because there are other things that are trigonal. That's the really big no-no is you can't go just purely trigonal. There are other things that are trigonal. This is trigonal planar, okay? Now, two, no, let's not use the same color. Let's use something different. Two bonding clouds and one non bonding lone pair cloud that looks like central atom one, 
two. And then you pretend that those electrons are there. Well, you can't just pretend. Those electrons are there. The non-bonding electrons are there. And that is when you get the general chemistry and we talk about the electron geometry versus the molecular geometry. However, for your guys' purpose, we're just talking molecular geometry, okay? Molecule shape, just the molecule shape, okay? So here, molecule shape, is affected by non-bonding electron clouds but the clouds of non-bonding electrons aren't in the shape, okay? They are there as a, they take up space, but they aren't a large quantity of matter. And because they aren't a large quantity of matter, they are not the shape. They affect the shape without being the shape. That's the best way I can say that. They affect the shape without being the shape. They push on the bonding electron pair clouds. They push on the bonding clouds, but they don't become a part of the shape. What you're seeing with regard to the molecular shape is this thing here. The molecular shape is this thing here in lighter blue. That's the shape of the molecule because it is most of the mass in the nuclei, essentially. The shape is affected, pushed upon by the non-bonding pair, but the electron clouds of the bonding clouds are what make up the shape. So this is called bent or, let's see, we call it bent or uh, there's another name for it. I can't for the life of me remember. This is embarrassing. Come on, bent or the other shape name for bent or angular. So this is either angular or bent is the name. And if you only remember one of those names, that's perfectly fine. Bent is a perfectly fine name. It's probably the name you'll remember. Bent is fine. Okay. Good so far? Okay. Does anyone need more time? Any questions? Okay. We're going to move forward. Now, for electron clouds. With four electron clouds, there are three options, okay? There are four bonding clouds, three bonding clouds, or two bonding clouds. Because remember, you need a minimum of two bonding clouds to have shape, okay? So let's do this. Four bonding clouds. You look like now in 3D. Uh, you, you are in 3D. Okay. Problem here is we haven't talked about how to draw in 3D. That's a problem. Okay. Let's talk about drawing in 3D. Okay. I know, I'm trying not to do this to you guys, but the problem is you have to learn the tools to be able to do these things. So drawing in 3D, 
means, first of all, there's four or more attached to the center. And for the purpose of this class, don't worry about it. All you need to care about is the number four. We're not going to go beyond that, okay? We're stopping at four. And actually, it really, that is pretty much where you generally stop for most things. It gets more complicated than that, of course, but we're just going to worry about four, okay? So, the symbolism. You use a straight line to equal in the plane of the page. You utilize an angular wedge, solid angular wedge, going uh, uh, smaller to larger from the central atom to uh, display uh, emerging from the page, coming at you, emerging toward you. Okay, so that means it's it's lying in front of or emerging from. And then finally, you utilize either a dashed or dotted decreasing in size wedge. So decreasing in size from the central atom, central atom to indicate uh, further away from the viewer. Yes. It might just do a dashed line. It's possible, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's acceptable, yeah. I tend to go with these because these are the most commonly utilized. Um, and, and it might even be that I go with these because these are what I was taught. So back in my day, these are what we use. So if I use them, they're good enough for you. It, tradition is not a reason for doing something in, in, inherently, of course. Uh, it, we used to traditionally, you know, uh, throw out food or whatever that's still good. We used to traditionally think that uh, radioactive paint was good for you, you know. There's all sorts of traditions that are just bad ideas. Okay, so uh, that's drawing in 3D. Does anyone need more time? Okay, then let's just do a couple of examples of this. Central thing in the plane in the plane, coming out of the plane, going behind the plane. That's the general idea. I don't even need to do more than that. That, that, that gets the gist across, right? Okay. This is in front. This is behind. This is in. Okay. Yes, you could do it differently than having two in the plane and one in front and one behind, but it's a lot easier to just do two in the plane and then one forward, one back. So that's why we usually do that. Make your life easy. This is a tradition that does make sense. Simplify your life. Okay. All right. All of that aside, back to four clouds. Okay. So four clouds in 3D, four bonding clouds. This is therefore something like carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen out of the plane, emerging at you, hydrogen, 
falling behind into the distance. Hydrogen. And typically people don't actually bother to make the hydrogen smaller, but I'm doing that to emphasize the fact that it is further away. In fact, I'll go one step even further to try to emphasize the three dimensionality of this and make it hydrogen. And so this hydrogen is closer to you. This hydrogen is much further away. And these hydrogens are all about the same. Okay. Now, what is this shape? There is a name for this shape. Now, because there's four and it is a shape, so three dimensional shapes are called hedrons. Okay. There's four things to this. So this shape. This is tetrahedral. Two dimensional shapes are called gons. Therefore, you have like a dodecagon. Three dimensional shapes are called hedrons. So a dodecahedron versus a dodecagon. The linguistic difference between a dodecahedron versus a dodecagon is the number of dimensions. Three dimensions, hedron, therefore tetrahedral. Okay. Good so far? Okay. Now, let's go look at one more or two more. Sorry. Yes. So then we've got three. Bonding clouds, one non bonding lone pair cloud. So, an example of this N H three. Structure of NH3, nitrogen in the center. We've got a hydrogen, but we've also got a lone pair, because what you would have done is you would have drawn nitrogen, hydrogen, 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 and the Lewis structure ends up with a lone pair like so. That's the Lewis structure, okay? So you end up with a lone pair also in the uh, plane. Then we've got a hydrogen emerging from the plane, you don't have to draw this H as large. I'm just doing that purely for the sake of emphasis to try to make that point now. I normally would make them all the same size, but I'm just trying to emphasize for you guys in an effort to make this clear. And if it does help you, I'm not gonna grade you down for it. I've never shown my wife me teaching this way because I honestly just started doing this this evening. I do weird things like that. I just decide to develop new ways of approaching things. Most of my teaching is just improv. Okay, so this shape is not trigonal planar because what's actually happening is this lone pair right here pushes down on these guys a bit. Lone pairs occupy more space than bonding clouds. And don't actually form the molecular shape. Remember, when we looked at three clouds with one lone pair, we said that the bond non-bonding electrons, the lone pair, the non-bonding electrons are not a part of the molecule. 
They participate in forcing things around, but they are not a part of the molecule. Okay. So what this thing actually looks like, if we were to look at just the molecule, is essentially a thing like an inverted umbrella. If you can imagine an umbrella that's been flipped inverted from the wind, okay? It's up, forget the handle, just imagine the inverted umbrella, okay? That's what this looks like with three arms. So this is like that if you think about it. So it's called, and it kind of looks like a pyramid. It kind of vaguely remember, re resembles a pyramid. So because it resembles a pyramid, someone decided, let's call this trigonal pyramidal. See how it vaguely resembles a pyramid. Here's the top of the pyramid, and these things kind of vaguely resemble a pyramid. So they decided, let's call it trigonal pyramidal. In some classes, they might accept just pyramidal. The problem is there's a trigonal bipyramidal. OK, there is a shape called trigonal bipyramidal. So therefore, you can imagine I have issues with calling this just purely pyramidal. This is also why you can't call something trigonal planar, because there's a trigonal pyramidal. There's trigonal planar, which this is not. And then there's trigonal pyramidal, which this is. OK, you guys still with me? OK. We're almost done. Okay. Pardon? Bias red. Bias red. Okay. Hang in there. Here we go. Drawing by 3D. We're skipping that. This thing, I'm not going to even bother with anymore. Now, four clouds, two bonding, and two non-bonding. Bless you. This is a very important shape. This is a shape that you should care about because you should care about, and there's a lot of molecules you should care about, but one of those molecules you should care about is what? What is, what, what is the universal solvent? And that goes into all sorts of things we have to define solvent. How about this? What's something that makes up a lot of your body? Water. Good old dihydrogen monoxide. Oh, look, I just showed you how to name something. That's dihydrogen monoxide. See how easy that is? Dihydrogen monoxide. Okay. We even talked about carbon dioxide. You guys don't even realize it. You actually use nomenclature in your everyday lives, and you've been using it since you were a little tiny kid, when you started speaking English, someone told you, well, you're breathing carbon dioxide or don't trigger the carbon monoxide alarm, right? Those are chemical names like you're just about, to, you're just learning to use now. And they're used in everyday language. They're present there. They've made it into the language you speak, okay? So you actually already know some of these names. Anyways, water, central atom, oxygen. The Lewis structure, oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Oxygen needs an octet. You've actually got eight valence electrons, six from oxygen, two from hydrogen. So two, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Two lone pairs, two bonds. Two bonding clouds, two non-bonding clouds. Let's move that oxygen over. It's in an awkward location. Oxygen. Uh, lone pair. It's going to look like bunny ears. Lone pair. We don't even have to use 3D here because those lone pairs, while we could pretend that they're three-dimensional, we don't have to bother. Okay? We can just pretend... That they're by putting them in these dotted things, they're going away from me. Fine, we'll do 3D. There, 
the lone pairs are going behind the page and the hydrogens are emerging from the page at you. Okay? This, however, you can see that there's only two things that are actually a part of the molecule shape. Here are the hydrogens that make up that molecule shape. The shape is just affected by non-bonding lone pairs. Electrons. Now, was it the shape of this? Go ahead and guess. It's bent, right on back to bent. Or angular, if you really want. So, yes. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six shapes determined by, because you've got two bonding, then you've got three clouds, two, three clouds, which is then three bonding or two bonding. And then you've got four clouds, which is either four bonding, three bonding, or two bonding, a total of six different possible shapes. But there is one that is redundant. Okay. Good so far? Okay, so very quickly, what you have to look at when you're looking at polarity is you must look at these shapes, and you have to look at how the dipoles interact on the shapes. Okay? So something bent or angular like this is always going to be polar. It's always going to be polar if there are polar bonds. Uh, that's the caveat to it, if there are polar bonds. If there's no polar bonds, it's very hard to argue that that thing is polar. However, however, there is one other thing there, lone pairs. So even something that has completely nonpolar bonds has got lone pairs that actually cause some sense of uneven electron cloud distribution on the molecule. It's arguable that something that is bent with no bond polarity is still the teensy tiniest bit polar. That's not something I'll ask you as a trick question. Okay, That's not something I'll ask you as a trick question. Is it something I could ask as a random question that is worth some extra points? I don't know. But I'm just saying it's an interesting fact. That's all. Okay. So bent in general requires polar bonds, okay? But if it has polar bonds, it will always be polar because you'll have things pulling in that direction and that direction, which is actually a total dipole going that way, okay? Same thing occurs when you look at trigonal pyramidal. With trigonal pyramidal, if you have any polarity on one of these three arms, it's going to pull in either that direction, or if all three arms are polar, it's going to pull all the way down through that molecule, straight down. Okay. Finally, tetrahedral. Now, tetrahedral is balanced. Four arms in opposite directions that are all balanced. So therefore, if these are all the same value, if you have polar, 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 but they're all the same polarity, pulling equally. It's just like carbon dioxide. They all pull equally, and this thing becomes nonpolar. For example, carbon, fluorine, 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 fluorine is a nonpolar molecule because all four arms are pulling equally. Therefore, they cancel out. If a single one of those, if a single one of those is something different, if you put a hydrogen on there, if you come in and you go carbon, hydrogen, fluorine, 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 now there is a dipole. Now there is polarity to this thing. If you make it carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, fluorine, if you do anything like carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, fluorine, fluorine, 
there is again polarity because there's going to be a net pull. There's going to be a net pull in this general direction. There's going to be a net pull in that general direction. There is polarity. There has to be perfect balance for the polar bonds to lead to a nonpolar molecule. That's why, yes, this is dense material, but if you start to step back from it and look at it from a big picture, there are easy ways to do these determinations. These things are graspable. You can see these things and make them easier on yourselves. Okay? It doesn't have to be super intimidating. You have to understand the background, but once you have the background understand, understandable, these pictures are decipherable. Okay? That's what I'm trying to get across. You guys comfortable with that? Okay. If this is making any sense, do you guys need any assistance? You know what? Rather than saying that, I'm just going to do super fast nomenclature. Okay? We have that thingy. Where did it go? Uh, do, 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 do. Intro chem sheet. There it is. Uh, now I'm going to switch. Uh, stop this share, and then quickly. Bloody hell! Where did it go? There it is, and that's it. There, share. You have this intro sheet again. The naming prefixes are right there. Okay, there they are. Okay, you'll have that. This hemi means half. We don't use that very often at all. Mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hepta, hexa, blah, 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 up to trideca. If I asked you a molecule for some bizarre reason with 13, you'd be able to decipher from this list. Okay, you know deca is 10, then it's 11, 12, 13. It's instinctual. It's something you know. You know this. And if you don't, you can go one and then literally on the page in front of you, number it. You can literally number it and give yourself a decipherable tool. I mean, literally right in front of you. Okay. So what I really want you guys to get from this is it is accessible to you. You can do this. So finally, very, very finally, nomenclature for covalent molecules. Molecule, nomenclature, okay, which means for covalent stuff, okay, what you do, these are going to be binary covalent substances. We don't go beyond that because to go any further than beyond that typically means you're going to go into some sort of organic chemistry. We don't do that. So binary covalent substances just means element number one, okay, with some sort of subscript uh, and the number in, in subscript. And then element two with a numbered subscript telling you that's to begin with the formula and then it translates into the naming is for element one if element one has two or more on the subscript use a prefix. Okay. If there's only one, no prefix allowed. You don't call it monocarbon dioxide. You just call it carbon dioxide. You just call it carbon monoxide. So it's only use a prefix if it's two or more, then you use a prefix. For element two, Use a prefix. And then alter the suffix, the ending, to ide carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. And finally, 
I know I said finally before. There we go. Anyone need more time? I'll give you a second if you do need. Okay. Here's the little thing. There are little tricks that you'll have to recognize. I'm not going to mention all of them here. But one example of a nuance, such a great word, is you say pentoxide, not pentaoxide. It's pentoxide. It is dioxide, of course. Uh, or you'll say, uh, you won't say hexoxide. You'll say hexoxide. Uh, heptoxide. Normally, if there's a vowel, you don't stick two vowels next to each other. You don't say, uh, well, at least for oxide, okay? There's nuance to it, a little bit. But the key is, the main thing is this thing. Very simple, nothing crazy. None of the transition element crap. None of the uh, polyatomic complications, okay? It's just binary. That's all there is to it. Done. You're good to go. See how easy that is? A lot less intimidating than ionic compound naming, I hope. Okay? It really is simple. It can be boiled down to this one slide, and you're good to go. All right, guys? Okay. Let's call it a night. I want to stop here. Remember, the Sac State assignment is due next week. The pure nomenclature assignment is due next week. All I need from that are the last three pages with your name on it. And if you have any assignments you want to turn in tonight, please make sure you do so, either physically or online. Okay?